Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Don Skaki. He is the co-founder of Homegrow Washington and also has written some legislation or uh, written uh, parts of the bill uh, for Homegrow in Washington State. Don, thanks for being on The Talking Hedge. Hey, thanks for having me, Josh. How long yeah, have you been The bill is on? actually HB 1019. HB 1019. How long have you been working on that? Oh, uh, on the bill specifically, about three years now, but on home grow, about 11 years. So uh, let's let's unpack that a little bit. Um, Washington State, um, they they voted for cannabis in, God, was it with medical? 2012. Oh, medical? 96, yeah. wasn't it? 98. Yeah. Or no, maybe it was 96. That might have been Cali. 96 is Cali and then 98 is Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you're right. Well, yep. you were right. <laughs> But yeah, um, so yeah, it's been a while, right? And, and and I think we're finally starting to see things kind of roll out. Virginia just announced that they were going to go um, a medical and rec at the same time. And then that's going to take like three years. So better than the 11 years. So tell me a little bit about what's been going on and why it's been taking so long. Sure. Well, you know, you referred to medical. Uh, medical was passed by initiative 692 in Washington state. But after that passed, um, the legislature didn't seem to want to even touch the subject. And it took a couple of years before they even came up with a, um, a work group. Uh, it was healthcare people, law enforcement, patients, and they arrived at the presumptive 60 day supply, which at that time was a pound and a half and 15 plants. And then uh, that pretty much was the standard and back in, uh, I think it was 10, 2010 or 11, uh, we first started seeing medical come out of the closet. And pardon me, I have asthma, so I get a little cough. <clears throat> but that's about it. And then um, dispensaries started opening up, uh, markets started opening up. And that really improved patient access uh, to obtaining cannabis for those people that either couldn't grow because they weren't in housing uh, that allowed for it, or maybe they just didn't have the talent. Uh, and then after that, when the initiative passed, uh, 502 in 2012, um, we rolled out, you know, full legalization without home grow. Uh, but then there was the Patient Protection Act, uh, ESSB 5052. Uh, that passed, and it was actually pretty detrimental to patients. It eliminated their, um, their 15 plant count. Uh, and it required them to register with the state if they wanted to possess anything more than four plants or uh, anything more than just a couple of ounces. So you can imagine that a patient with a need um, that doesn't smoke, maybe they needed tinctures or what other, you know, other methods that take more cannabis to produce, uh, they, their supply and access was severely restricted. And the problem that was restricted is because the retail system was so focused on high THC products and, you know, turning a profit that they really didn't give uh, patients much attention. Then the state came and they authorized uh, medical uh, authorization or endorsement for stores to carry products uh, that required them to actually have a consultant on staff because a lot of people coming into medical uh, they didn't have a background in cannabis and they needed some advice and guidance, but that was very lacking as well. And it's a big reason why a lot of patients are still not on the registry, not participating in the, in the retail system and either underground or getting it through the unregulated market. So Homegrow was not part of that. And uh, we've seen the other states, you know, there's now 15 states and Washington one of the first and Illinois, one of the last are the two states that don't have it. Uh, New Jersey is still working things out even though they passed, but uh, it doesn't look like they're gonna have home grow either. And this is not something that's new. Colorado had it from the start. The other states, uh, no state that's had home grow in their law has ever repealed it. It has, I mean, if you Google home grow arrests, uh, they all relate to, uh, black market activity where people come in and they don't live there. They're basically using the house as cover 
for uh, criminal activity. But the home growing is really specific to someone that just wants to grow a few plants to control what they take into their own bodies. I mean, when you grow it, you know it. So we think it's time and uh, we found legislators that agree. And a surprising amount of legislators agree that this is something that the state should be able to trust our uh, citizenry with. And we hope that this bill passes this year. This bill has actually gone further than any previous effort. It's more extensive than any previous legislation. And um, we are just at this point waiting for an executive session of the Appropriations Committee to hopefully move on to a floor vote in the House. Do you think uh, cannabis being deemed essential business during the last last year uh, at the onset of the pandemic had something to do with um, you know these these members of government in the House and Senate being more involved or in, uh, interested in home grow and um, and then I, I want to follow up with why because it seems like that goes counterintuitive because there's no tax revenue. Right. Well, it, cannabis is essential business because there is so much tax, tax revenue. Uh, you know, it was almost half a billion dollars in just excise tax. And overall, the state uh, does receive about over a billion dollars worth of benefit from uh, cannabis business activity, be that from uh, B&O taxes or salary deductions from employees. And, you know, all those employees actually spend those wages in their local economies. <clears throat> so, you know, it's not just the state that's benefiting, it's the cities and neighborhoods uh, and everyday people that benefit from cannabis being legal. Exactly. So, so why would they have home grow? Why would they back that? Because it's something that people want and it's something that's not problematic. Um, we've had a lot of interest in uh, licensees wanting to explore the new market. Um, you know, currently they're able to sell farm direct to patients that are on the registry. They can sell them seeds, plants, clones, all that. Um, but this would open up a new market of, of home growers that would also want those same items. And although the language is not in the bill at this time, uh, I could see it being a good revenue stream not only for businesses for profit, but uh, for uh, revenue for the state, because I would imagine that those products would still be taxed at the 70, uh, I'm sorry, the 37% excise tax rate mm -hmm. as well. So, but it, you, know, you is, said it so as a matter of fact, you just said, oh, well, they, they just want to uh, <clears throat> do it because they're representing us, like as government reps should represent us. But in my experience, it's been like, if it doesn't generate them revenue or money or taxes or whatever else, they don't really care about, about the people, but maybe that's what local government is supposed to be, representing the people. You mentioned that Washington and Illinois are the only ones that don't have home growth. So it's not that common to not have home grow. Why is it that these two states are the only ones to not allow it? Um, well, I think it goes back to your question about the legislators themselves. Uh, these people get elected by the votes of their constituencies. And they've found uh, that a lot of that, you know, a line that we like to use when we talk to legislators is, do you know that cannabis is very popular in your district? So, and they realize that. Uh, but to, to some degree, uh, you know, reefer madness has not gone away. A lot of uh, people, uh, especially more conservative people, uh, still feel it's, you know, the devil's lettuce. And, you know, they have all these overblown concerns that really don't bear out, in fact. Uh, you know, they always say marijuana is a gateway drug. You know, everybody that went on to other things started with marijuana. Well, you know, happy meals are gateway drugs then too. So there's a big um, discrepancy about diversion to the illicit market. And that was a big thing, but we've seen from every other rollout that hasn't really happened. You know, you don't see people selling bathtub gin or, you know, cigarettes out of the boot of their car. So right. is that even a, a legitimate argument anymore? Well, if you go on our website, Homegrow Washington, to the About page, there's actually a short one-minute video there 
that we produced uh, last uh, August, and or maybe it was October, but um, it actually shows some representative home grow gardens. And one of the scenes in there is of six plants hanging and drying in front of a fan. And when you look at that image, you can see that there's really, we're not talking about a lot of marijuana at all. So to consider that uh, somebody would grow six plants. You know, these are people with otherwise fulfilling lives. You know, they got jobs, they've got families, they might be involved in civics or, you know, Little League and everything else with their families. But to think that somebody like that at, in the current situation is going to grow six plants so that they can take the time to go sell it on the street or in a parking lot or attempt to divert it to the black market that they probably have no contact with. They're not only not gonna con contact the black market, they're not gonna compete with them or the state. It's just, it's really just not a, a reasonable premise to consider. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I in fact stopped growing um, back in medical, uh, you know, you could grow up to 15 plants and then you could grow for two other people. So you could grow up to 45, 45 plants. Yeah, in the collective. Right. And so that's what I would do. Uh, a friend of mine had multiple sclerosis. He since passed away of MS, but that's what I did until wholesale prices dipped down below $3. And then that's really my break even with the electricity bill and everything. So I stopped. Right. I would think that more people would probably look at that too and say, okay, convenience. It's not that easy to grow cannabis. People think it's just weed and it's not. Um, but what is the importance of it? I mean, I think economically we can look at all the picks and shovels and ancillary businesses. You're going to sell more soil and all these things. It's going to increase, um, I think, a lot of sales locally. Um, I think it's a good thing. But in your own words and opinions, why is homegrown so important? Well, it's about freedom, honestly. You know, we're supposed to live in a free country. And uh, if you're not hurting anybody else, then why shouldn't I be able to grow a few plants, you know, before... Uh, Ainslinger went to Congress and had it made illegal. Uh, it was in our pharmacopoeia. Uh, the AMA, because it was referred to as marijuana in that testimony and not as cannabis, the proper name, uh, it kind of slid through unnoticed. And after the fact, you know, people were pretty upset, but, you know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle at that time. And it's taken us over 80 years to get back to this point. So, you know, I mean, people do all sorts of things that aren't good for them. But, you know, it's a matter of freedom of choice in this country and the reform of marijuana laws and home growth should be part of that. Well, we've been to a lot of events, you know, over the last few years in the, in the cannabis industry and in hemp as CBD has been taken off. Where do you kind of see events moving? Because uh, it used to be we, we would call a shit show a dirt show. One of these like shows where, you know, you, you didn't you weren't really interested and there was just a lot of companies selling dirt. Um, right. Whereas like a home grow that could easily turn into a dirt show on purpose. <laughs> so right. as you're selling all those picks and shovels and dirts, I'm wondering uh, if the post-apocalyptic era with, with events coming back, um, that could be a good thing. What will events look like for home grow post pandemic? Well, it's it's hard to say. You know, originally when uh, Oregon first passed their legalization, they had a competition at the state fair with a blue ribbon winner. <laughs> I mean, that that is making cannabis regular in society as regular as anything else. I mean, you know, I can go into my supermarket and walk down the aisles with bottle after bottle of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know that cannabis will get to that point. I don't know that we want to get it to that point. Uh, you know, I, I go to other states. I go to Colorado to see my daughter and, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of contacts in Oregon. And uh, in Washington, where you have to go to the store and buy it in a sealed package, you can't look at it, you can't smell it, and you can't pick it out, is vastly different than when I can go to Colorado and not only look at the jar, but I can tell the bud tender, ooh, I want that nug right there. And they mm -hmm. pick it out and sell it to me. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, it's like when you go to the store, you know, I know you can buy a six pack of tomatoes, but you can also go to the stand and pick out whichever ones you want, be it bananas or oranges or apples or any of that. And I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be. You know, it, we're not talking about nuclear waste here. We're mm. talking about a plant. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern about if you have home grow that the kids will get to it. Well, you know, kids shouldn't be hopping fences and stealing other people's property. Those are crimes. And to be honest, they're more likely just to have an older person go to the store and buy it for them because it's ready made. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just steal cannabis and then stick it in a pipe and smoke it. You've got to process it and cure it. And it's it's quite a long wait time. And I don't think kids are willing to put in that kind of effort. So Yeah, Halloween is always funny every year when the the hyperbole hits the right. news waves and people think we're going to waste edibles on kids. It just never happens. Yeah. Um, to, go, to go back to your point about events, though. Uh, I, I think that as can cannabis does become more regular in society, uh, we will see events uh, that went on like they did before. There's, uh, you know, right now in law, you can't have a, uh, licensees cannot have a competition. They can't have a cup. But if I was to have a home growers cup and just have it be an ego thing of you come and you compete, and there is no, maybe, maybe you get a little, you know, Hey, here's your prize. You know, it's, we're not talking about a money-making venture for uh, the person growing. It's, it's more of an ego thing, mm -hmm. uh, a recognition amongst your peers. And I think that's great. I think that uh, events like that, uh, little conventions, uh, I, I'm sure that home growers, especially those that aren't good, would love to have an event where they can talk to people like Ed Rosenthal and Jorge Cervantes, you know, master growers mm -hmm. that have done this forever. Uh, you know, in Seattle here, we used to have gardening with Cisco. A guy had a garden show on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, and he was a master gardener from UW, and you'd talk to him about your, your stuff in your yard. So I imagine that one day there'll be a radio show called Gardening for Frisco. And you can talk to them about whatever problems you have in your cannabis garden. And we found that the people that I've talked to, at least, if they've never grown before and they grow cannabis, that tends to inspire them to grow other things like vegetables or flowers or plants. So I think it'd be, it'd be good. It's good for people. And, and people that are stuck home now with COVID, they need something to do to keep their minds and hands busy. Yeah, we, we might not make it to a farmer's market. There's going to be rec stores and, and things like that, even for medical to, to be sold in. So it's not going to be totally normalized, but it will be nice in the eventuality um, when, when we do have home grow. What's it going to take for that, Bill? You mentioned early on in the podcast that it, you've been working on for three years. Is 2021 the year that it passes? What's needed? What's required? How's it going to pass? Well, we are working with the Cannabis Alliance, an industry trade group, and we're working with uh, the Scotts Company, most famous for miracle Grow. And the Scotts Company owns uh, Sunlight Supply down here in Vancouver, Washington, locally. And uh, they've got bought up by Hawthorne Garden Supply, which is one of the Scotts subsidiaries. So they have a fulfillment center where people can order online and they can get all sorts of equipment, uh, soil, amendments, all of that. And they see this as a natural expansion of their business. So they would like this bill to pass. So if we can get through the appropriations committee um, and the sponsor there, uh, Tim Orangeby, the chairman, I'm sorry, not the sponsor, the chairman is a co-sponsor. So we're hoping to see that executive session happen and this move out uh, onto the floor, out of committee and onto the floor. And from our head count of votes there, it looks like we have a very strong chance of passing the floor and which would mean passing the house of representatives. So from that point, and we have uh, our cutoff for the bills in the house of origin uh, is February 22nd. So if we can get out and onto the floor and pass by February 22nd, or I'm sorry, no, it would move to the floor by the 22nd. If we can get out of the house of origin uh, by that cutoff date, 
that I don't have right in front of me. Uh, it would then go over to the Senate and then we'd have a few hearings over there, another floor vote. And then pending any amendments, uh, the bill would be passed and the governor could sign it. So our chances look better this year than they have ever looked in the past. That's good news. Um, is there anything that um, you'd like to say to any other state, including Illinois or anybody else, um, Virginia or Kentucky, when they figure out that uh, <clears throat> they need to legalize to, to fund their pension system? Any of these uh, on onboarding states, New York or whatever, any advice, anything that uh, you think is worthy, uh, something that they should hear? Sure. Well, um, on that point, I've actually been contacted by the New Jersey and New York efforts. Uh, we have collaborated, we have shared our experiences, and we're even talking about having a nationwide group uh, that's more collaborative. Uh, you know, activists, you know, we're not in this for the money. I, I've not been paid for my work. I don't care to be paid for my work. Uh, John Kingsbury and myself, the co-founders uh, of Homegrow Washington, we basically uh, paid for this effort out of pocket. And, but we don't want to have to see everybody else start from scratch. There's been a lot of work that's been done that others can benefit for from if they only know about it. And so that kind of a collaboration, I think, would be very helpful in moving things much more forward, much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very similar to the scenarios that you and I had being on the same board to try and overturn the felony for marijuana lounges, uh, which right. is a class C felony to own and operate a marijuana lounge to try and work um, with other states and other areas. As you remember, we covered in 2019, eight different states bills, including Illinois and uh, everywhere else that have. Alaska. And yeah, all, all of those. We covered those for at least nine months. Every every single time we met uh, bi bi-monthly, we would, we would talk about that and try to get involved in Massachusetts and, and other states to cross-pollinate ideas and, and try to make uh, all of that better. So sounds uh, very familiar and, and similar to um, all of those efforts. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's another area that um, has not been problematic in law. And, you know, I don't get it. They, they don't want people consuming in public. All right. So the natural thing, I mean, it's just like you don't want people walking around the corner or up and down the street with uh, an open bottle in their hands. It's almost Don't entrapment. Not give cannabis consumers a club to go consume at. Right. It's almost entrapment where you're going to sell something and then ticket them for not consuming it somewhere. As, as a right. tourist, you can't go to your hotel. You can't even consume in your car because um, that's public, I guess. So yep. it, it's pretty ridiculous. All of these laws, like you mentioned, are like very early on, we're adults. It's because we should be doing this. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that as soon as you can grow at home and have it normalized, as well as um, you know, being able to, to see through a window, people consuming, that is the window into the soul of the community, I think is, is the cannabis cafes and all right. of that will, will eventually be normalized. Um, well, I, I don't know about that. I mean, even right now, when you look at bars and, and taverns and lounges, uh, it's, it's a rare occurrence that you can actually go up and stare inside the window. Mm -hmm. You know, most of those places are blacked out. I guess it's not, that's not consistent across the board, but, uh, you know, it's usual, it's regular, it's, mm -hmm. it's nothing, it's not, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. And smoking in a club in a club setting shouldn't be a big deal either. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in, in celebration of the uh, home growth summit, I think it's the first annual uh, is there anything that we miss that we should be throwing out to to the people that are interested in home grow locally, domestically, internationally? Well, my advice to anyone that has an interest in legalizing home grow would be let your legislator know. Let you know the people that represent you, your representatives, your senators, uh, and at the national level, your congressmen and representatives there. Uh, let them know that you support normalization of marijuana laws, cannabis laws. You know, in Washington state here, there's a bill uh, 1210, HB 1210, that's going to change the word cannabis in place of marijuana throughout state law. And that's, you know, it seems like a, a, a small step, 
but it's significant. You know, we, we shouldn't be in a panic about a plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it sounds kind of cheesy to say, oh, call your legislator. And, and you hear that and it's kind of in one ear, not the other. But like legitimately people, I went down to the Capitol in Washington. I went and talked to people and gave my own story about how my friend doesn't like Marinol. He doesn't like synthetic cannabis. He wouldn't take Epidiolex. He wanted to smoke a joint. He didn't even want to vape. Right. He wanted to combust. And that was his choice. When I express that to people in the House and the Senate down in our state capitol, people are like, oh, really? Wow, I didn't know that. And right. so you, you kind of take things for granted and you assume that there's other people doing it for you, but sometimes you have to do it yourself. Yeah, no, there, there's not. <laughs> there's not. Yeah, tell your story because that's more impactful than the you know anecdotal evidence that you could say, oh, my grandma's doing great. Well, go down there and tell them that story firsthand. It's going to be a lot more impactful than somebody else telling it for you. Right. And, you know, you hit the nail right on the head when you say they don't know. Our elected officials come out of the constituencies that they grew up with. And if cannabis is not their thing, their experience is limited. Uh, and that's true for every issue. That's why lobbyists exist. And even though I'm not a paid lobbyist, I'm a lobbyist. You know, as a constituent, when you bring uh, your issue to your legislator, you are lobbying. So I, I think the problem is a lot of people are just totally unfamiliar with the, with the uh, process. Uh, you should find out how to contact your legislator. Uh, you know, they want to hear from you. Honestly, they do. They're happy to meet with you. It, you should know what you want to talk to them about. Uh, you should know what you want them to do. And because they are unfamiliar with your subject, you should offer them a solution of how to fix the issue to your satisfaction. So, you know, check with your uh, legislative information offices, uh, find out who your legislators are. In Washington, we, you can just Google Washington District Finder, put your information in there, and it'll tell you what district you're in, who represents you, and how to contact them. And then write them an email, uh, write them an email, and then follow up with a phone call. And, Talk to the assistant and say, hey, did you get my email? I want, a, I want a meeting. And they'll set that up for you. That's their job. You know, it, they're not people uh, above us. They work for us. And, you know, as their employer, you should tell them what work to do. Yeah, and especially on a day like lobby days where they try and uh, be available for everybody, you can set up uh, four hours worth of appointments, 15 minute blocks and just bounce from office to office and meet with half a dozen or, you know, 10, 15 reps, um, you know, from around the area. So I would highly recommend you do that. You get uh, a lot more out of your, your day by doing that. And it's incredibly beneficial. That, um, that's a great way to get your feet wet um, and meet other like-minded people and, uh, you know, learn a bit, learn a bit about how to handle yourself. But the best thing to do, if you really want your legislator's attention, is to get a one-on-one -on -one meeting mm -hmm. where you get the whole 15 minutes. And I've had meetings run long. If your legislator knows that you know what you're talking about and has an interest in what you're saying, your interest might, you know, your meeting might run an hour. Mm -hmm. It's up to them. Depends on what their availability and what their level of interest is. Right. Uh, if people do have a, a high level of interest in the Washington home grow and or a home grow for their own state, how can they get a hold of you? Where are you at? Either social media, email, how can people get a sure. hold of you? Well, we have a page on uh, Facebook, home grow Washington, one word home grow, second word Washington. Uh, our website is homegrowwashington.com. Uh, right now it's specific to Washington state. But there's a lot of great information there that you can get ideas uh, from for other states. Um, you can always email us at homegrowwashington uh, at gmail.com. Uh, we also have info at homegrowwashington.com. Uh, you know, the first one we didn't have a website yet, and now we do. Uh, you know, and I'm Don Skacky. I'm the only Don Skacky on Facebook, and I'm public. So uh, message me, and I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you. Yeah, all about um, House Bill 1019. Use that as a, a template or an example for home grow. 
uh, kicking off uh, the Home Grow Summit today. All right. With that, I think we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Don Skacky. He's a co-founder, Home Grow Washington. Don, thanks for being on the Talking Hedge. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.